Hello fellow botanists, welcome to our next lecture in our trip through the plants. In this particular lecture, we're going to look at the seedless vascular plants in particular. So, where are we in our phylogenetic tree? Well, uh, we're still talking about plants, and remember that plants are referred to as embryophytes. So, embryophytes, because uh, the sporophyte is nurtured by, the embryosporophyte is nurtured by the gametophyte uh, in all of our plant groups, and that's what uh, distinguishes our plants from our green algas. Now, within the plants, we're going to be looking at a group of plants called the vascular plants. So previously, we looked at the non-vascular plants, our liverworts, uh, hornworts, and mosses. Now we're going to be looking at plants that have vascular tissue. And so you can see this particular group on the phylogeny in your textbook. And uh, on tree three, so we're now in tree three, this group of plants over here is our group of vascular, uh, sorry, this entire group over here is our vascular plants. And as you can see, there are two major groups of vascular plants. So one is the seed plants, and people often think that all plants have seeds, but that's not the case. It's just a subgroup of vascular plants. There's this whole other group of vascular plants that are seedless vascular plants. And seedless vascular plants represent what's left of many, many um, very diverse lineages uh, that were... Um, on the earth for well over a uh, hundred million years through the uh, Silurian Devonian, through the Mississippian, Pennsylvanian. Uh, and so at this point, we have, uh, most of those groups have gone extinct, but we still have some reminders of the diversity of these plants that once were on the earth. And in fact, a lot of these plants were right here in Kentucky, particularly um, you can see fossils in eastern Kentucky and throughout the Appalachian Mountains. We'll start again with our general characteristics. Uh, I'll talk quickly about tissues and organs, and vascular tissue is going to uh, feature prominently. We'll take a look at the life cycle, and in particular we'll see an example of the life cycle that's sort of like the life cycle that we've always been seeing, but we'll also take a look at some particular reproductive structures that are sort of uh, new additions to this base life cycle that all plants have. And then uh, we'll look at some of the, the major phyla that we have in the groups, and in particular there are two major phyla. And the first phylum uh, is going to be uh, our lycophytes uh, over here. So it's this particular group right here. And our second phylum is going to be the uh, manilophytes, which is this particular group here. And we'll look at some representative groups within each of these, particularly Lycopodium and Selaginella for our lycophyta, and Silodium, Equisetum, and of course, ferns. And ferns is a very broad group. We'll take a look at some ferns within our manilophytes. We have our, of course, vascular tissues xylem and phloem. And remember that xylem has uh, lignin, this very strong substance in its secondary walls. Uh, in fact, um, we sometimes then refer to all vascular plants as lignophytes. Our vascular tissue is in the sporophyte generation, not the gametophyte generation. If we're about to see our gametophyte generation is, is going to get much smaller. Our sporophyte generation is getting much bigger. So this vascular tissue is in the sporophyte generation. And because we have vascular tissue in the sporophyte generation, this makes possible true organs. So in our non-vascular plants, our mosses, our liverworts, our hornworts, we didn't have any true organs. We had some uh, structures that were sort of analogous to leaves or analogous to stems, but this time we actually do have our three true organs. So we have stems, and the idea behind stems is that they can support um, structures that are going to grow on them. In particular, they're going to support leaves and our roots, our other two types of organisms. Also remember that stems, um, in fact, all plants um, have apical meristems at the tips of uh, growing structures. And these apical meristems are regions of undifferentiated cells that uh, divide and are capable of making new structures. And so our apical meristems are going to produce our new organs. And they're going to be situated on our stems and on some roots, and they're going to allow us to make more stems, leaves, and roots. And finally, because uh, our uh, we have vascular tissue and our sporophytes are getting bigger, our stems are now going to become branched. In fact, very, very branched and very, very large. So this is what we see going on over here in several of our characteristics that are basal for all vascular plants. We see that we have vascular tissue, the sporophyte can be branched, and that we can have this combination of both vertical uh, stems and horizontal stems as well, leading to eventually, as we'll see, a very enlarged sporophyte.
Our roots aren't necessarily basal. Uh, we'll see roots evolve at several different points, but our roots can anchor plants. And uh, much as uh, we had rhizoids anchoring plants in our non-vascular groups. But because we have vascular tissue in our roots, our roots can also absorb waters and water and minerals, uh, something that um, rhizoids cannot do quite as well in our non-vascular plants. And finally, of course, our third organ is leaves. And we have two different types of leaves. So <clears throat> the first type of leaf is a microfilm. And if you remember and use your botanical Rosetta Stone to help you decode this word, uh, we'll start over here at the right and a fill is leaf and micro means small. So a microfilm, of course, is a small leaf. And in particular, what makes it small is that it has one vein. So if this is a little microfill over here with some blade tissue, notice that it just has a single vein going through it. It's a single vein and single vein. And here's a, a picture over here of a small microfill on a selaginella plant. Megafills, on the other hand, uh, are referred to as mega or larger because they have multiple branches. And so in our little uh, figure over here from the textbook, you can see that there are, uh, is a uh, initial um, uh, bundle of vascular tissue going through it, but then this vascular tissue branches. Um, so we have many veins in our megafill, we have multiple veins in our megafill leaf. And one final note I'd like to make is that all you really need to have a megafill is two uh, veins. And so we're going to see some megafills eventually that just have two veins. Um, in fact, um, megafills, as long as they have multiple veins, don't even necessarily need to be huge. And so there are certainly are some microfills in the world that are, in terms of absolute size, physically bigger than megafills, but the difference is going to be the number of veins that they have. Our second general characteristic is the life cycle. And as, um, as emphasized throughout our lectures, uh, all plants have the same life cycle. So it's the basic life cycle is not changing. Um, but sometimes the way these particular structures look in this life cycle can change. And so to make this point, once again, I've put my diagram of the plant life cycle next to an example of the life cycle of a seedless vascular plant. And in particular, this is an example of uh, a fern life cycle. Let's start by comparing uh, gametophytes. So Remember that I drew a very amorphous gametophyte in the picture of in my diagram of a plant life cycle because gametophytes are going to look very, very different in different groups of plants. So in the ferns, this is our gametophyte over here, this structure right here. And if you sort of flip it, not quite 180 degrees, you see that it kind of looks heart shaped. And that's sort of a really distinctive uh, um, example of a gametophyte for a fern, so this heart shaped gametophyte. Then the gametophyte is going to have, of course, our two different types of gametangia. So uh, we have an antheridium that holds sperm cells, we have an archegonium that holds an egg cell. So here is our antheridium, our, and our antheridia tend to be just a little bit further. Um, away from the notch over here, so this would be an antheridium over here, and our archegonia tend to be a little bit closer to the notch, and our archegonia is going to hold the egg cell. Of course, with all plants, our egg cell doesn't leave the archegonium, but what happens is sperm make their way from the antheridium to the archegonium, and again, we're depending on water to do this. So we're depending on a drop of water to land on our antheridium, and if it works just right, it sort of moves over to wherever there's an archegonium, and sperm cells are able to swim down the neck of the archegonium and fertilize the egg. Product of fertilization, then, is a zygote, and the zygote, of course, is still within the archegonium, and the zygote is going to divide by mitosis. So Here's our zygote over here, the product of fertilization, and it's dividing by mitosis to start to produce a sporophyte. Now, initially the sporophyte is really small. It's an embryosporophyte, uh, as I've indicated over here. And notice that our embryosporophyte is still growing out of our gametophyte, just as it is in every single plant uh, in the plant kingdom. However, our gametophyte down here is nurturing the sporophyte and it's getting a little crinkly and it's it's on its way out. Um, eventually it's going to die over here. So there we go. Our, our little gametophyte is eventually going to die as the embryosporophyte gets bigger. And now 
unlike what we saw in our uh, non-vascular plants, we have a mature sporophyte that's capable of living independently of the gametophyte. So the gametophyte eventually dies, the sporophyte gets much, much bigger, and this mature sporophyte is now probably what most people would recognize as a fern. Of course, our sporophyte produces um, many spores in sporangia. So I've drawn a sporangium here, and we can still see little sporangia that are right here. Actually, they're sori. We'll get to that in a second. We have a little sporangium right here, too, in a sorus. And inside our sporangium is lots of spores. And our spores, of course, are produced by meiosis. And when the sporangium is mature, our spores are released. And when a spore starts to divide by mitosis, we return to a uh, gametophyte. So, a reminder, what's changing? And first of all, we have much smaller gametophytes, as I've mentioned. So this gametophyte here, although it looks like it's about the same size as a full-grown fern, is actually very, very small. We'll see them in lab, and even big gametophytes are like the size of, of a little fingernail. They're, they're very small, and, and they can be even smaller than that. So our gametophyte is small, but our sporophytes are getting much larger. And uh, you know how large a fern can get. Um, these are even small ferns compared to uh, tree ferns um, that at one point were growing all over the uh, Pennsylvanian, Mississippian periods. And in fact, we still have a few uh, tree ferns left actually down in Australia and New Zealand. So the sporophyte can become very, very large. And this is, remember, made possible by the presence of vascular tissue. And because the sporophyte becomes so large and the gametophyte is very small, eventually the sporophyte becomes independent of the gametophyte. And that's what we have indicated over here on our tree. One of the uh, basal characteristics of all vascular plants, the mature sporophyte, is not dependent on the gametophyte at maturity. Remember that now the sporophyte is larger and independent. So if we take a look at these pictures that we've been working on, or sorry, that we started in our last lecture, um, when we began with our non-vascular plants, we had the gametophyte generation that was the uh, dominant generation, and our sporophyte, the purple tissue here, depended on the gametophyte. And we saw that with our green gametophytes in the moss and our dependent sporophyte growing from it. Now, in our uh, vascular seedless plants, our gametophyte is very small, our sporophyte is much larger and eventually independent of the gametophyte, and we start to see that transition happen in this little picture right here. So here is the little gametophyte, um, a little sporophyte is starting to grow out of it, but as our sporophyte becomes much larger, it will eventually become independent and start to look like a fern. What's the significance of all of this? And keep in mind that what plants are doing is they're adapting to land. That's sort of the whole story behind uh, plant evolution. They're finding better ways to live on land. So if we now have a larger independent sporophyte, it can do several things, a couple of things at least, better on land. First of all, if the sporophyte can get much larger, it's going to be a much better competitor for all sorts of resources like light, nutrients in the soil, etc. A moss clearly is not going to be able to uh, outcompete um, a very large sporophyte like a fern. Okay. Secondly, uh, we also are able to produce many, many more spores. A sporophyte of a moss basically has one sporangium, and while there can be a lot of spores, as you saw in that one sporangium, if we can produce many, many sporangia on the undersides of, of our fern leaves over here, then um, think about how much more bang for our buck we get per fertilization event. And remember, the fertilization events are still difficult. They still require water, they're still happening on land, and so if we can get a bigger sporophyte per fertilization event, that gives us more spores, that gives us, as I said, more bang for our buck. Now, with this basic life cycle um, comes some new reproductive structures. And as I said, um, the diversity of plants in our seedless vascular plants is, is quite large. And so we're going to see the possibility of many different reproductive structures. Uh, and so not all plants in our group are going to have all of these structures. So I'm going to try to, try to lay out uh, some different possibilities for types of reproductive structures that we can see. So let's begin with uh, what's known as spore condition. And so spore condition refers to the size of spores, more or less. And so we can have 
plants that are homosporous, so the spores are the same size. We can also have plants that are heterosporous, in other words, the spores are different sizes. And there are two sizes in particular, megaspores, which as you guess are large, and microspores are small. And uh, the size difference here can be an order of magnitude or more. So here's an example of a megaspore uh, compared to a microspore. And clearly you can see a large size difference. And when we do have heterosporous plants with megaspores and microspores, it's often the megaspore, in fact, it's always the megaspore that gives rise to what we consider to be uh, the female plant that produces eggs. And it's the microspore that gives rise to the, the male plant, the male gametophyte that produces sperm cells. Now, once we have a heterosporous life cycle, that gives us the potential for some of these new structures. So, as a very quick reminder, in our homosporous life cycle, we have a sporophyte right here that produces spores in a sporangium. There's our sporangium with spores. Meiosis leads to spores that then eventually can give rise to a gametophyte. Here's our gametophyte, and our gametophyte is capable of producing, in most cases, um, both types of gametes, sperm cells and egg cells. However, in a heterosporous life cycle, what we're going to see is that we have two different types of spores. They're going to give us a lot of variation over here in both our uh, gametophyte portion of the life cycle and in our sporophyte portion of the life cycle. Perosporous life cycle, we're going to begin again with our sporophyte, just as we did in our homosporous life cycle. So here's our sporophyte right here. 2N plant. Our sporophyte, though, is going to produce now two different types of spores. So it's going to produce megaspores. And it's going to produce these megaspores in a structure that we're going to call a megasporangium. So a sporangium is, a, is an angios. It's a container that holds spores that are large, that are mega. So I've drawn a megasporangium over here with four megaspores produced by meiosis. So here are four megaspores that are now haploid. They're 1N. And these megaspores are going to, if we take one of them, divide by mitosis. And instead of giving us a gametophyte that's capable of producing both types of gametes, we're going to get a gametophyte that's now only capable of producing one type of gamete. And so if a megaspore divides, we get a female gametophyte with an archegonium that gives us an egg cell, or that can hold an egg cell. Another type of spore that our sporophyte can produce are microspores, and it's going to produce those in a microsporangium. So our microspores are also produced by meiosis, which means, of course, that they're 1N. So if one of our microspores divides a bunch of times by mitosis, this is going to give us now a male gametophyte. And it's a male gametophyte because it only has an antheridium that holds sperm cells. Once, of course, we have our two different types of gametes, if fertilization happens, hopefully it will, then we get a zygote. Remember that I'm putting the zygote over here above the line to show that it's 2N, but in fact our zygote is still actually right down here uh, being held onto in the archegonium by the female gametophyte. And our zygote then will divide by mitosis just as it did in our initial version of the plant life cycle to give us a sporophyte generation. So our initial life cycle hasn't changed in the fact that we still have a sporophyte and a gametophyte generation. So we get alternation of generations. Spores are still produced by meiosis. Um, our gametes are also produced by mitosis, giving rise to a fertilized egg cell, a zygote, that then divides to return us to our sporophyte. The only thing that we're doing really is that we're now adding two different sizes of spores two different types of gametophytes and two different types of spore containers to hold these different sizes of spores. So why, again, should uh, all this be uh, so important? And as we'll see, it's evolved probably several times in different groups of plants, which indicates that it's a fairly important adaptation. And the thought is that heterospory is going to increase genetic variation. So if we come over to our original plant life cycle again, and we look at a sperm cell and an egg cell here, notice that the sperm cell and egg cell were both produced by mitosis from the original gametophyte, which means that a sperm cell and egg cell would be genetically identical. If this sperm cell actually fertilized this egg cell, our zygote would have absolutely no heterozygosity. I mean, this is as inbred as it's possible for an organism to get. And clearly that's not always a great thing for organisms. Uh, heterozygosity is, is a, usually a very important thing. Genetic diversity is a very important thing for organisms and for populations. So what our heterosporous life cycle does is allows us to decrease genetic variation. 
are each one of these spores over here, whether there are microspores or megaspores, is genetically different from other spores, which means that this gametophyte, our male gametophyte, is genetically different from our female gametophyte, which means that if one of these sperm cells fertilizes one of these egg cells, we don't have uh, a completely uh, um, homozygous uh, genotype at every single locus. We have some heterozygosity in our genotype, and that heterozygosity is very important for um, the maintenance of the organism, our future zygote, and of course heterozygosity is very important in the population as well. In addition to our uh, change, our, our potential um, different sizes of spores, uh, we can also have different types of reproductive structures in terms of how these sporangia are arranged on the spore, uh, uh, yeah, on the sporophyte. So first of all, uh, we can have, we don't have to, but we can have sporophylls. And so a sporophyll is a leaf, it's a fill, and, but it's a leaf that contains a sporangium. So here's a picture of a sporophyll. This is the leaf over here, and it has a sporangium on top of it. And so this would be looking down. So what I'm gonna do is very quickly um, give you a sideways picture, sort of a stylized sideway picture of what this would look like. So this would be a sideways picture. Here is our sporophyll. Here is our sporangium. In other words, our um, reproductive structure sits on a leaf. Now, uh, what we can do once we have many different sporangia, in particular if we have many different sporangia that are put on structures such as sporophylls, is that we can create a strobilus. And so the idea behind a strobilus is that it, it's an arrangement of sporangia or sporangia bearing structures at the tip of a stem. This is a diagram of what a strobilus would look like. Here is our stem in a plant. Each one of these little structures right here would be a sporophyll. So this is a sporangium sitting on a leaf. And if we cluster a number of these spore-bearing structures at the tip of a stem, we get what we call a strobilus, a cluster of sporangia here at a stem tip. And sometimes the sporangia can just be by themselves. They can be naked. Other times they can be part of a structure like a leaf. Sometimes they can even be part of a structure like sort of a modified stem. We'll see variations of all of this. But this is an example of a strobilus that we're going to see in many of our uh, seedless vascular plants. This is my stylized picture of one, but here's an example of what a strobilus would look like in an actual lycopodium. And so you can see that it's got a stem over here with branches and lots of little leaves, but each of these structures is a strobilus. And if we take a cross section to one of these stroboli, we see what I was trying to draw over here. This is a stem. There are little leaves. You can see these little, these little projections here are leaves. And these greenish structures are the sporangia that are sitting on the leaves, on the sporophylls. And they have lots and lots of small spores in each of them. So again, let's think about what we're trying to accomplish evolutionarily. And the idea is that any sort of strobilus structure tends to facilitate spore dispersal. If we put all of our sporangia low on the plant down here, when the spores are dispersed, they're not going to go as far. But if we cluster our um, sporangia at the tips of stems, they're going to go much further, and that's what we want. We want to be able to distribute our spores and thus our gametophytes and our genetic diversity as far away as we can from the parent plant so that we're ultimately not competing with the parent plant. And so again, we're going to see many different stroboli, and we're going to see stroboli evolve in many different groups suggesting that they are evolutionarily a very advantageous structure to have. With these basic structures, we're ready to take a trip through our uh, phylum of our seedless vascular plants. And what I'd like to do before we look at our living phyla, our extant phyla, is to look at uh, ancestors and relatives. And here's a slightly um, more extensive version of tree three. And so these are the characteristics that we've talked about for um, all vascular plants. Um, but off to the side over here would be a primitive, would be some examples of primitive vascular plants um, whose descendants aren't with us anymore. And so they're an uh, extinct group and uh, they get the little um, rest in peace cross over here to indicate that they are extinct, going up to the, uh, the big forest in the sky. So one example of 
an extinct group of plants, um, early vascular plants, would be Agalophyton major. And so these plants have stems. All right, so I've used red here to indicate a novel uh, structure. So we have stems. Remember, we didn't have stems before in our non-vascular plants. So they're basically just stemmy plants with lots and lots of branches over here. They do have some rhizoids, so still not true roots, but rhizoids growing out of the stem. So we can see those right here to help anchor the plant a little bit, help with a little bit of absorption. Uh, they don't have any leaves, these agalophytons, so no microphylls, no macrophylls. They do have sporangia, of course, because of the sporophyte generation. They have sporangia that are at the tips of these branched stems. All right, so nothing yet that quite looks like a strobilus. And our textbook is also reminding us over here in this little diagram that they also have stomata as well. So keep in mind that not only did the sporophytes of some of our um, non-vascular plants, such as mosses and anthocerophytes, have stomata, but of course all of our vascular plants, the sporophytes, are going to have stomata as well. Our first group of living um, our first phylum of living uh, seedless vascular plants is the lycophytum. So now we're going to look at a bigger version of tree 3 over here. I sort of chopped off our agalophyton over here so we can see our extant groups. And we're going to look at the lycophyta, which is a monophyletic group indicated by this portion of the tree right here. So what do they have? Well, they have stems, but we've seen stems before. Stems were one of our basal characteristics. We now have roots, so roots are going to be a basal characteristic now of, of all the other uh, plants that we're looking at. All right. So in addition to true stems, we have true roots, but the roots are going to be growing out of the stems. All right. They're what we call advent adventitious roots, and we'll talk a little bit more about what an adventitious root is later. We also are going to see leaves for the first time. So here is the evolution of leaves, so specifically microphylls, so leaves with just a single vein. And we're going to have sporangia. We had sporangia before, but what's different is that these sporangia are going to be on leaves, giving us sporophylls. So here we have the evolution of sporophylls. And so these characteristics, microphylls and sporophylls, are going to be seen on all of our lycophytes. But within this group of lycophytes, as I said, there can be a lot of diversity. And so what I'd like to do is show you an example of some of this diversity by looking at a couple of genera. And so the first genus to look at as an example is Lycopodium. So I'll back up over here. So we're going to start by looking at Lycopodium over here, and then we're going to move on to Selaginella. And so Lycopodium um, is, uh, has all three of our organs now as we just mentioned, and remember that these are in the sporophytes. In terms of its reproduction, it's still homosporous, still just one size of spore. It has sporophylls, but what we're going to see that's really interesting in Lycopodium and a few closely related genera is we're going to see sort of a set of different phenotypes that suggest a transition from a cluster of sporangia um, sorry, randomly placed um, sporangia on the stem to something that would actually be a strobilus. So this is a, a closely related species of lycopodium that we have here in North America. This is persia, and we've got some in the lab for you to see this week. And so notice that we have a leaf over here, and um, some of these leaves, you know, this one, this one, this one, they have these little sporangia over here. So these would be sporophylls. So we have some sporophylls in here, and not some sporophylls down here, and some more sporophylls down here, etc. Um, but nothing that looks like a strobilus, nothing that looks like a cluster of sporophylls at the tip of a stem. Let's take a look at um, another species of Herpersia down in Australia. And this is really cool for all sorts of reasons. First of all, the fact that you can have one genus that are, is, is widely distributed natively as North America and Australia is really neat, suggesting it's really ancestral and goes all the way back to Pangaea at least. But notice in this Herpersia species that we have now a group of um, leaves over here. These are just uh, microphylls. Then we have a cluster of sporophylls over here, followed down here again by a group of plain microphylls. In other words, we're starting to cluster our, our sporophylls like we would need to cluster them for a strobilus. Which takes us over here back to North America and a lycopodium species that we can find uh, all over Kentucky. And uh, in our Lycopodium North American species, notice now that we actually have a strobilus. So we go from uh, 
clusters that aren't on the tips of stems to distinct clusters with sm uh, smaller sporophylls to something that we could actually recognize now as a strobilus. And so we see, of course, this in a lycopodium that we could collect around here. There's lots of branches, lots of leaves over here on these little branches, but then we have several um, stroboli uh, clusters of sporophylls at the tips of stems. Our second uh, group of lycophytes uh, would be in the genus Selaginella. And again, we have some Selaginella species in Kentucky. Not a lot, but we've got uh, at least one, maybe a couple that are native. And these species, again, like our Lycopodium and Persia, had all, have all three of our organs, stems, leaves, roots. They can have uh, stroboli, but what's different is that uh, these uh, are, um, Selaginella are heterosporous. They have two different uh, sizes of spores, so megaspores and microspores. And so in a strobilus, we can see these two different types of sporangia that hold our two different types of spores. So here would be a sporophyll right here with a sporangium, and we see a large spore. So this is going to be a megasporophyll. It's a leaf with a sporangium that holds a megaspore. And this is going to be a microsporophyll. It's a leaf with a sporangium that contains microspores. So this is a very different sort of strategy than what we just saw in Lycopodium. Uh, we now have our heterosporous uh, condition with two different types of spores that are going to give rise to two different gametophytes and so on. Finally, uh, I just wanted to make a mention of other lycophytes that are out there. And as you see in our tree, if I back up, um, we have one final set of uh, lycophytes. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about Isoedes, which um, is a species, uh, sorry, a genus that still exists, but I'd like to mention Lepidodendrons because there are a lot of uh, lycophytes that are extinct going back to our Carboniferous forests. And these um, lycophytes, many of them form very, very large trees. So all the lycophytes that we have today are, are very small plants, but we had uh, at some point lycophytes that were real giants. And so here you can see a cast of a lycophyte tree. So notice it's a, a very big thing, and um, there are even trees that are much, much bigger. This would sort of be a smallish lycophyte tree. But on our lycophyte tree, notice these little triangles, uh, sorry, these little diamonds right here. So these are the scars left by microfills. So it still has microfills that cover the trunk. Uh, and eventually, of course, were a little bit longer and sort of produced something that looked almost palm-like, although, of course, not closely related to palms at all. So if you went back to a Carboniferous forest in Kentucky, you would see a lot of these trees. And so, you know, unfortunately, they're no longer with us, at least in their living form, but so many of these trees ended up dying and being very compacted um, in uh, somewhat swampy conditions, giving rise to lots and lots of coal seams, which of course are still very much a part of the history of Kentucky. So not with us in their living form, um, but we're still thinking about them in many other ways. Our second phylum of seedless vascular plants is the manilophytes. Uh, if you look in the textbook, um, you, particularly older versions of Campbell will refer to pterophytes. So the manilophytes are a monophyletic group that includes the pterophytes, the ferns, and um, several other closely related uh, groups. So now classified over here as manilophytes. And this, uh, as I said, is a monophyletic group, and they have um, several features that are common, at least in the ancestors, although we're going to see that a number of these features have been lost in later groups. So they have stems, and so stems, of course, evolve down here uh, in our basal vascular plants. They also have roots. Here we get the evolution of roots. And they have leaves, but what's different about the leaves of manilophytes compared to lycophytes is that manilophytes have megaphylls. So remember that megaphylls are leaves with multiple, uh, stem, uh, multiple um, veins in them. So uh, they tend to be larger and we see the evolution of megaphylls right here. So our microphylls and our megaphylls evolve separately. It's not that megaphylls came from microphylls, they have very different evolutionary origins. And again, like our lycophytes, we have sporangia on leaves. But remember, if our megaphylls evolved independently of microphylls, then these sporangia on leaves, these sporophylls, also evolved separately. And so we're going to see in our uh, groups of 
nephrophytes, uh, different uh, types of sporophylls. And we're going to take a look at three major groups of manelophytes over here. I'm going to start with our silotophytes, and uh, these are not the most ancestral group, as you can see, but they have the most ancestral characteristics because a couple of reversions over here, as we'll talk about in just a minute. I'll then mention our sphenosphytes, our horsetails, and we'll look at some interesting things they do. And finally, we'll look at a group that, uh, we'll look at ferns, and most of our ferns are um, philocopsidas over here, but ferns is a very broad group that can uh, also include plants that aren't in this particular um, group right here. So our representative example of uh, silotophytes is silota, uh, commonly called a, a whisk fern. And so here are a couple of pictures of whisk ferns, and notice that vegetatively they look pretty primitive. We have stems, we can see these green stems right here, but there are no true roots, there are no leaves, and so for a long time, people thought that these were actually um, very ancestral uh, vascular plants, sort of um, similar to our agalophyton fossil um, that I showed you um, earlier. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, people even thought that they had leaf-like structures called profils. So you can see a little structure right here, just sort of a little, it's kind of a, a point sticking out. We've got a couple here, and they even come in little, um, can come in little pairs like this. They can be singular, they can be paired. And people thought that these were initially early leaves, so they called them profiles, leaves that are um, primitive leaves. And it turns out not to be the case, but the name profil is, is still with us. They have reproductive structures that um, reflect sort of this primitive state. So we have synangia. And these sort of yellowish green structures right here are synangia. And so they're angia, they're containers, but they are brought together, right? They're, they're sort of a synthesis of three containers. In fact, they're usually three um, sporangia that come together to form each synangium. So we don't see any sporophylls because there are no leaves. We don't see anything that looks like a strobilus per se, although notice that most of our synangia do tend to be more towards the end of stems. And um, like many of our manelophytes, um, these are homosporous as well. We're looking at several reversals here in terms of a loss of roots, um, a loss of leaves, but um, these reversals aren't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, in fact, many reversals actually are advantageous in particular environments. And so if you've ever had a chance to go to some place like a volcano, um, uh, some place like Hawaii, or if you can't get to a volcano in Hawaii, um, if you just take a walk uh, along sidewalks or vacant lots in Florida, you can see um, lots of silotum growing out of little cracks in the lava or little cracks in the sidewalk. Because they don't have leaves, because they don't have roots, they tend not to lose a lot of water and they can do really well in sort of very um, arid, um, challenging environments. So just because you don't have uh, dry features doesn't necessarily mean that you're a failure. They are weed all over um, many parts of Florida and are early colonizers of volcanoes and lava. Our second group of seedless vascular plants, sorry, our second group of manilophytes in the seedless vascular plants is Equisetum. At least that will be our example genera, genus. And these are commonly known as horsetails, so um, Equus um, from the Latin horse. And they have all three of our major organs, uh, stems, roots, and leaves, but the leaves are microfills. And as you remember, um, we said that our group over here tended to have megafills. You know, manelophytes tend to have megafills. So what's going on with that? And the hypothesis is these are microfills by reduction. So we can see a number of these um, microfills in our example over here. Um, these, so um, this would be our stem, which is often hollow. We have lots of uh, these microfills at a node. So here's a, a node, here's a node with microfills, and so on. And so it's thought that these microfills are very, very reduced megafills that have basically been reduced to the point of having only one vein. Um, wasn't able to show you the roots here, but take my word for it. Uh, equisetum plants have roots. Their reproductive structures um, start to look again a little bit more like what we were seeing in the lycophytes, but with a few twists. So we have um, stroboli, plurals for strobilis, but the structure of these stroboli is a little bit different. 
Our strobilus is a cluster of structures known as a sporangiophore. So this is the tip of our stem over here, and we have a whole lot of sporangia. You see all the sporangia over here, so that's what makes it a strobilus, a cluster of sporangia at the tip of a stem. But our sporangia aren't naked or they aren't on sporophylls, they're on these structures called sporangiophores, they're actually modified stems a little bit. So here we see a sporangiophore in cross-section, and it looks a little bit like a mushroom with uh, some sporangia underneath. And so keep in mind this is a three-dimensional structure that I'm trying to reduce to a two-dimensional structure, so it would actually be sort of a cluster of these. And then we're putting a whole bunch of these sporangiophores together to give us a strobilus. All right? So remember, what is a sporangiophore? It's a four. It's a structure that bears sporangia. This is what it would look like in... Um, a slightly more realistic drawing, less cartoony. So here is our stem of an equicetum plant. Here is the strobilus, the tip of it. You can these out of these little uh, segments is um, the outside of a sporangiophore. Here is the strobilus in cross section. So this picture is roughly analogous to this one, um, and you can see the sporangio um, four is a little bit better. So this would be one sporangio four right here with a couple of uh, sporangia dangling down. And this is a, sort of a more three-dimensional look at what a sporangium would look like. Sorry, that's what a sporangio four would look like. It has several sporangia and the sporangia would open and release lots of spores. So the last thing to say about the spores of equicetum is they come with these little structures called elaters. So here's a picture of a spore and the elaters are wrapped around and so they're little protein arms. And as the protein arms become less humid, they unwind and spread out. And so this is going to push all of the spores apart. It's going to push them out and this can happen quite rapidly. And so in fact, they can actually sort of pop out of the sporangium over here and disperse quite a long ways. To be able to see elaters uh, opening up in lab, but just in case you aren't, I wanted to give you a preview of coming attractions. So here's a little YouTube video showing elaters opening. And initially, I think the um, it, these um, videos are in slow motion, but then in about a minute or so, uh, they'll go to normal speed. And this is um, set to the music of uh, the opening of 2001, also Sprock Zarathustra. And here you see them sort of popping at what would be more like real speed. Like to make your own video of elaters opening? Uh, I hope you get the chance, and you too can post it on your U own YouTube channel, and uh, you could have an even better video than they did. The last slide I wanted to show you about our equicetum or relatives over here is to remind you that while we have a few living equicetums with us. Uh, Throughout much of plant history, we had a lot of equicetum-like plants, sphenosphytes, that were really integral parts of the vegetation and the forests that we had um, throughout much of the Carboniferous and even beyond. So uh, we have a couple pictures over here um, of recreations of different types of um, equicetopsidas over here, fossil um, equicetum plants. Uh, from the Triassic. These uh, recreations are at the uh, Carnegie uh, Natural History Museum in Pittsburgh. And um, the idea behind the museum is they show lots of, of fossils of uh, dinosaurs and other animals, but um, they've done a really good job of recreating the plants. So uh, what I did is I completely ignored most of the dinosaurs and took pictures of all these fantastic plant recreations that we have over here. And this, I think, gives you an idea of what it might have been like to walk around a, a forest um, anywhere from uh, 100 and, and sorry, 200 to 300 million years ago.
Now imagine walking through a bamboo-like forest, but the bamboo plants aren't bamboos, they're um, Equisetes or Neocalamites, um, and occasionally you'd see some kind of little dinosaur uh, flitting through the distance, or uh, flying overhead. Our last group of manilophytes are a group known as the ferns, and fern is a term given to a lot of different seedless vascular plants, and so I put ferns in quotes. But um, if people think about ferns a little bit more uh, in a strict sense as opposed to a, a broad sense, there are um, there is a group of ferns, a group of plants, that is a monophyletic group. And so I'm thinking about ferns in this narrower monophyletic sense. And if you want to know more about ferns, uh, take spring flora, we'll, we'll get into ferns. So vegetative characteristics of ferns are that they have leaves and megaphyll leaves. And so remember that we think the ancestor, you know, the ancestral manilophytes had megaphylls. Um, but this is the first point we've seen sort of really nice big megaphylls in the groups of plants that we've looked at. So in a fern, I and mean, this whole thing is just one leaf right here, and it's got little leaflets. So these are really large leaves with lots of, of branching veins. And they have stems. Uh, most uh, stems are underground and, of course, lots of roots as well uh, to anchor um, these very large plants. We have sporophylls now, and so you can see a sporophyll. So this leaf over here, of course, is a, is a, a sporophyll. It's got lots of these little structures on it. But now each of these little structures is not a sporangium. It's what's known as a sorus. And so a sorus is actually a cluster of very small sporangia. And you can see that better in this magnified picture down here. So each one of these little dots is a cluster of sporangia. Each of these little black dots is one sporangium, and inside the sporangium are lots of spores. And these particular sporangia is a very specific number. It is 64 spores. Now, ferns, uh, like the plants that we've, uh, like the other manilophytes that we've seen so far, have been homosporous, but um, there are a few ferns that are going to be heterosporous, um, and for the most part, we're going to gloss over those, but I just wanted to let you know that there are occasionally some heterosporous ferns. And in particular, there is this whole other extinct group of ferns known as the seed ferns, and they certainly were uh, heterosporous ferns. But we'll take a look at the, the homosporous variety. Now, just to make sure that we've got the terminology down, um, here are a few quick questions. So first of all, do ferns have sporophylls? And yes, they do. Here we see this fine example of a sporophyll. Our second question is, do ferns have megaphylls? Yes, exact, uh, they certainly do. So this would also be a megaphyll, right? It's a phyll that has multiple veins, as opposed to a phyll that has sporangia. Now, our third question is, do, sper do ferns have megasporophylls? And this is sort of a test of how well you can read um, botanical terminology. So we have a leaf, a megasporophyll would be a leaf that has sporangia, but our sporangia contain megaspores. So do ferns have megasporophylls? And the answer is no. Most of them don't because they are homosporous. All right, so just be careful as you're reading words over here. Um, this is a reminder that you always have to read from right to left uh, to understand what a word means. The final thing I'd like to do uh, for our little trip to the ferns is show you a YouTube video and let's look at these particular um, sporangia over here. They have a really neat trick and their trick is that they can they have actually evolved to fling spores, to catapult them. So let's see that. Start playing the video. Let me just get you oriented. So we're looking at a little portion of a fern leaf. So here you can see the leaf in the background. This structure right here is one sorus. And notice all the little sporangia that are clustered in one of these sorus. So a sorus is singular. Two or more together would be sori. Think of someone from uh, England maybe apologizing. Sorry, mate, right? It's multiple sauruses. Uh, and what you're going to see is that um, these sporangia are going to open and they're sort of going to be pulled back by this little backbone structure. So, so they're going to be curled up like this. The backbone is going to open them up and then at some point as the backbone loses uh, water cohesion in those cells, it's going to fling the spores. All right. And this is real time, by the way. So take a look at, at how impressive the spore shooting can be. And um, 
This is very different music than the last video. So you see some sp um, sprange opening here. Here's one. Here's one. We'll watch this one. It's bending back. It's bending back. And it shoots. There's another one going. Bending back. And so on. Okay. So really neat. And hopefully you'll be able to see this in lab if you're patient. But I wanted to let you know what you could be seeing. Here's another one again. Bending back. All the way back. And... Pow, right? And you can start to see all, a lot of little spores accumulating that have been thrown all over the place. Yeah, so really neat, really fun to watch. Much fun though as it is to watch uh, little sporangia of ferns fling their spores. Um, even if you can't see this during most of the year, uh, ferns are a really neat group of plants to look at in general. And around here in, in uh, Kentucky and particularly Eastern Kentucky, we have a real uh, diversity of ferns. Um, we're, we're really spoiled with the biological diversity we have. Here's a very common fern that you might see throughout the year. This is a Christmas fern because its leaves stay green year-round. And um, so if you know if you're hiking in, in November, December, January, um, it'll stick out. You'll, you'll see the quote-unquote Christmas ferns because its leaves are green at Christmas. But there are a lot of other ferns too that you can see throughout the spring and the summer. Um, here is a fern that we don't have in Kentucky, but uh, I wanted to show you a little bit of the diversity that exists in ferns in other parts of the world. So this is an epiphytic fern. It's a staghorn fern, and it's often used as a decorative fern in um, houses uh, because you don't need to pot it in soil. Um, it's very good at absorbing the water it needs from the air, and uh, it creates sort of this little um, nest almost of dead leaves, if you will, and that helps it hold on to water and trap water, and it also helps attach it to the sides of uh, other organisms, such as trees or even the sides of buildings and so on. There are a lot of epiphytic ferns, um, and finally there are even some tree ferns, and so you can get some tree ferns in Australia and New Zealand, and these are really huge plants over here. So uh, I don't have a, a, a good m measure of scale, but a person would be sort of, you know, this would be like a six foot tall person. So we're easily looking at, you know, 15, 20 foot high trees at least, and they have enormous leaves. So this whole leaf, so this whole structure right here is one leaf of a tree fern, and it's divided many, many, many times. So leaves are not just compound once or maybe twice like we have over here in most of our North American ferns. These leaves can be compounded three, four, five, six times, and, and the whole leaf can easily be uh, eight to ten feet long. These are really spectacular. So if you do get a chance to go down to Australia and New Zealand, um, Please do uh, look out, uh, check out the uh, tree ferns. They're they're really neat. And once upon a time, again, our forests were probably covered with lots of tree ferns before we had uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms. And finally, um, what's not to love about sperm ferns? So here's a little heart-shaped fern gametophyte, and this is a final reminder that everything we've been seeing so far, and most of what we've been talking about, have been sporophytes. But ferns, of course, like all plants, also have gametophytes, and so we'll get a chance to see a gametophyte in lab this week. And what can you say about them? They're just cute. They're lovable. So enjoy them. Here is... A continuation of our summary of plant characteristics and hopefully in class we'll have a chance to fill this out. So uh, at this point you should have been able to fill out this list for non-vascular plants. We're now thinking about seedless vascular plants. So see if you can figure out and remember which are some of the major characteristics that we've seen in seedless vascular plants. All right, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, lecture on seedless vascular plants and I'll be back soon with gymnosperms.